we had a pretty controversial title to this panel about family offices, fortune or flop. And I think in the last few years, we've seen an, an incredible amount of chatter around family offices, especially in the hubs, the wealth hubs of Singapore and Hong Kong. I read a stat a couple of days ago that in 2018, there were 50 family offices in Singapore. And today, they estimate over 1,500. Okay, that is probably the fastest growing sector in Singapore. We assembled this panel today um, to be quite diverse, made of family principals, uh, people running multi-family offices, people, run, uh, people running or investing money on behalf of a principal as well. So really quickly, I want to introduce everybody. Uh, Lynn, next to me, she's a principal and founder of TH3 Capital, a single family office based in Singapore. TH3 is deeply rooted in creating positive impact Thank you. and has, has a culture of purposeful work and partnership to extend the family's legacy of giving back. Lynn is also currently a managing director at Deutsche Bank, where, has, where she has served many of Asia's wealthiest families for decades. Next to, uh, next to Lynn is Raj. Raj is MD and head of Asia Pacific for Iconic Capital, a privately held investment firm with over 80 billion in assets on behalf of some of the world's most influential families, pensions, sovereigns, and organizations. Prior to Iconic, Raj spent a decade at Goldman Sachs in various glo global offices. Kenny, to his left, managing director and founding partner of Corey Private, an endowist group company, which uh, we acquired a majority stake of last year. Corey is a multifamily office, or what they call EAM, based in Hong Kong, serving mainly greater China tech executives and multi-generational Asian billionaire families. He brings over 25 years of experience, everything from McKinsey to Solomon Brothers, uh, Credit Suisse, and most recently was on the original founding team of Julius Baer in Asia. And finally, Jimmy. Jimmy has been a portfolio manager for over 35 years, including 16 years at GIC, where he rose to become the head of global equity research. He is currently CIO for the liquid financial assets of Pacific Eagle Asset Management, which is one of the most established and largest single family offices in Asia with billions under management as a single family. So thank you so much for being here, everyone. Um, I'm gonna kick this off actually to Raj. Um, Raj, the family office term has been used in many different ways the last few years. How would you define family office? Well, thanks for the, it's, I, clearly it's a loaded question. Um, and, and the reason for that is it's, it's, it's clearly definitionally ambiguous. And the term family office means very different things to different people. Um, and the reason for that is there's such a breadth of spectrum in terms of what a family office is and what it isn't. Um, you know, at one end of the spectrum, on say the right hand side, you have incredibly large, very sophisticated, very well resourced, um, infrastructure strong, single family offices that operate at a world-class and institutional grade level. Uh, and so that's, and they have two elements to their family office. They probably have an investment office and then they have a services engine for lifestyle and, and other things. At the other end of the spectrum, um, you have say a, a family office with say 50, 100, 150 million dollars of assets, still definitionally a family office, but they garner that definition often through virtue of the, the exemptions and some of the, the, the taxation schemes that you see in various jurisdictions, and that could be a principal plus administrative person plus a bookkeeper uh, and maybe a pet, right? And so the, the, there in that end of the spectrum, you see the definition of a family office also used. I think the harder definition is less the right-hand side or the left-hand side. I think the harder definition is in the middle, which is um, what is a $500 million to a $2 billion family office look like? And typically there are two parts to it. As I mentioned, the, the investment arm and then there's a services arm. The investment arm is always really hard because at that level of scale, it's hard to figure out what to insource, what to outsource, uh, what sort of pedigree of resources you can actually attract, retain, uh, develop, groom, compensate, uh, and where do you genuinely have sources of competitive advantage that you can scale? Uh, and especially sitting here in Singapore or other parts of the region. And so definitionally, I think it's very complicated. Uh, but the main thing I would say is that people often conflate 
the distinction between um, investment excellence and services excellence. Um, some family offices are investment first, services second. Other family offices are services first, investment second. But I think the best ones manage the, ca the calibration between the two in the most resource efficient way, the best. It's a okay, thank, thanks Raj. I mean, Jimmy, I mean, just from your experience and, and borrowing what Raj has said, family office is not just about asset management. Um, what is the investment office in, a fa in, in the family office you're running? Like, how do you define the purpose yeah. of the work that you're doing? Family office is a very uh, difficult concept. When I first joined the company 10 years ago and told my friends in the industry, friends from GIC, and I told them that I'm now with a family office, they all felt very sorry for me. They thought that I'm going to have an office at home and no proper career. <laughs> Okay, today I'm going to tell you what a family office is because it's something that many people are interested. I think the best way for me to explain to you is to tell you exactly what this family office does. This is a family office of one of the most successful business persons I have known, uh, Mr. Tanoto and his family, first generation wealth. Uh, and they have built over 55 years a global business interest in leading, leadership positions in uh, pulp paper, viscose fiber, palm oil, and significant interest in, uh, in energy assets. And they are globally exposed and operate in four areas, ICBC, not the Chinese bank, don't get worried. <laughs> I stand for Indonesia, C stand for China, B stand for Brazil, and C stand for Canada. Okay, there are four things that we do in the family office. Uh, number one, it is the family business. The family will, be coming, will come together to decide how to allocate capital, uh, how to invest, which country to go into, and which product lines, upstream, downstream. That is very important. There's always the start of a family office. That is the family business. Then the second, uh, which is also equally important and run by uh, professionals, will be wealth uh, transfer. Right? The, wealth managed, the, the uh, wealth planning part of it, which basically uh, involves governance, constitution, the transfer of uh, multi-generation wealth. The third part is what many of you in the audience will be familiar with, and that is the investment arm, and that is where I'm, uh, I'm closely involved in. And the fourth part uh, that we do is the Tanoto Foundation, which is the philanthropy arm of the Tanoto family. And here they have uh, uh, the, the founders, chairman, uh, Mr. Tanoto, and his wife, uh, Mrs. Tina Tanoto. They have this vision that they want to provide opportunities for people to realize their full potential. So in the countries that we operate in, uh, Singapore, Brazil, China, and Indonesia, they do have a strong education program, scholarship program, leadership program, and medical research. Uh, and, and, and that is essentially the heart of the family office. So I guess for many here, you don't need to be doing all four functions. Some will be doing more, some will be, being, will be doing less. But essentially, this is the heart of a family office. Thanks, thanks, Jimmy. That's a great segue to Lynn. So you're the principal yeah. of a family, of your family. And how do you define success? Um, actually, I loved the point that Raj made that there are no two family offices that are alike because family offices are essentially private offices of families and they would um, naturally mirror the values, the goals of the families. And success for us would mean um, that the family office fulfills its goals and missions of its principles. What's really important for, for um, my family has always been that we would be very good stewards to everything that's been placed on our hands. So when we conceived um, the, the private office, it really was meant to grow and protect our financial interests so that we could do two things. The first being uh, directing capital for good so that we could make a positive impact in the communities and in the ecosystems that we're operating in. And the second thing would be to secure a good future for ourselves and for the generations after. 
So success in a family office to me would look like um, uh, the, the office really helping us navigate the complexities of asset management, of philanthropy, as well as helping us uh, navigate the challenges of leadership transition and wealth transition. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Kenny, you talk to many families on a daily basis. Is the way they define success similar? Is the service you're offering the same? Or, or how do you think about it? Right? What is, what is the, are there strategic goals that these families are after? I, actually, it's interesting. I, I'm also learning as I uh, hear my esteemed panelists speak and uh, I'm trying to, I think, cut up the, the same pie in a different way. So let me try to do that. Um, first of all, we, we look at wealth and because we, we, we manage quite a, a number of clients. We have our single family offices that we manage. And as uh, Greg said, we have our EAM business, uh, which tends to be uh, smaller. So the way I look at wealth, I mean, and, and this is very broadly speaking, uh, on the one level is kind of like the, the size because it does change the way people think. Um, so typically, uh, in like the below five million, that's where we work very closely with in Dallas, uh, especially with the next gen, and, and that's an area which we're very excited about in terms of working with in Dallas. Um, we have a number of our clients, and it's, a, it's, a, it's the biggest part of our growing uh, a book, which is kind of the, the five to $200 million range, which is a lot of these, what we call them, that's where we handle our multifamily office business, and that's growing quite a bit. And of course, I'm just picking a number here, 200 plus million is where people really start uh, developing and setting up their family offices. And uh, that's a, a big part of, uh, of our core business and how we started up Kare Private uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, another way we look at the business is kind of what generational wealth uh, that people are. So as Greg said, uh, six, about 60% of our business is coming from greater China. Uh, the rest of that business is coming from uh, around uh, Southeast Asia. And depending on the generational wealth, the goals are very different, okay? So I would say, and again, I'm cutting up the pie slightly differently, but it's the same thing. Uh, the first thing when people bring us aboard is kind of wealth representation. And this is one of the key reasons why we teamed up and we are very happy teaming up with in Dallas, which is we have this fundamental belief that those representing the bank are representing the bank and not the client. Um, so we spend a lot of time finding the best custodians. Uh, we have to filter through tons of different products. We have to find great uh, product providers for access for our clients. Uh, so this is the, the purest form of what I call open architecture and open custodian. So wet wealth representation, uh, wealth optimization, where we're, again, looking at uh, investments across. Uh, I mean, to be honest, most of our clients are not looking to maximize their uh, investing. They're looking to optimize it. And by that, I mean wealth preservation, okay? Uh, last year, this covers the first two issues, but... Last year was a big year for us because we really, I mean, I had to make so many phone calls on the bank formerly known as Credit Suisse, so it kept me very, very busy last year. Um, and then the, the third main area which we're looking at, again, is wealth structuring. Uh, that's everything from setting up uh, private label funds, VCCs, uh, uh, various uh, intermediary structures, uh, looking at uh, uh, trust foundations, uh, se uh, optimizing tax, tr tax structures, uh, uh, going to setting up uh, probate structures for Cayman, BVI, what have you, uh, hiring uh, educational consultants uh, for people looking at Deerfield Academy in the United States, so on and so forth. We're, we're doing a lot of that. And again, for us, it's really outsourcing this stuff, but we, it's just that we've come across so many of these different issues. Now, again, as, as Raj said, uh, there, there's, it's, there's the black side, the white side, and there's the gray side. So we, different goals, but I would say that those goals are, are definitely uh, uh, guided by what generational wealth. And again, for, for our client base, uh, just, just say a lot of the tech guys coming out of uh, greater China who are, by the way, setting up family offices here in Singapore, uh, uh, clearly the way uh, it, it's, it's actually less on the investment side and, and that's why Singapore is so, th those numbers are absolutely true. Um, I mean, 
I also know the numbers in Hong Kong, it's you know, nowhere near the 1,500 that we're seeing here in uh, Singapore. So uh, uh, Singapore has done a fantastic job and, and, and I think all of us have to adjust the services that we provide and, and how we approach our clients. That's a, okay, so that's a great segue into, um, so Raj, a question for you and Kenny and anyone can chime in here. Let's think about the math behind setting up and operating a single family office and when it may or may not make sense. Okay, so I, the, the overarching comment I'd make on this question is it's probably the greatest single miscalculation that we see occur uh, amongst family offices that establish. Um, you know, about 12 years ago when we established our business, we took the liberty of traveling the world and we met with some of the most successful single, single family offices on the planet, everywhere from the East Coast of the United States all the way to Europe, um, out here in Asia. And one of the things that we learned is that there are certain operating expenses that you need to consume as a single family office that depending on the mission and purpose of what you're really focused on, um, in order to qualify you as what genuinely world-class. And, and the reason why I think it's important to aspire to being world-class is this, the capital that's been generated to seed the family office has obviously been incredibly hard-earned. And as a steward of that capital for multiple generations, then you want the best eyes, ears, and infrastructure to support the allocation of that capital and the services that you provide around that family office. And so as a result of the work that we did, and we track this every year, I would say last year we find that a family office of a, quant a single family office with a quantum of say a billion dollars is probably having a five to seven million dollar a year per annum uh, operating expense for both their invest primarily their investment team and some services. And so the question you've got to ask yourself is that if you are below that number and say meaningfully below that number, can you afford to spend five to seven million dollars of operating expense in order to justify that world-class investment capability. Um, some single-family offices of size, scale, sophistication can, but many cannot. And so I think there is a, a very significant miscalculation um, in, in order to arrive at what an appropriate team looks like. Um, and so we found that anything below sort of a billion dollars, um, it makes sense to figure out what you insource, what you outsource. Uh, what's the right hybrid approach, and how can you scale into world-class investment capability on a global basis? It's very hard to do that intermediating investment markets sitting here in Southeast Asia. Awesome. Okay, so, I mean, it's, it's a misnomer because, you know, if I had a $100 million of liquid capital, and that doesn't include my operating business, I could have a huge operating business as well. If I had $100 million of liquid, cap liquid capital, I would be an extremely, extremely, extremely wealthy person. But having a family office, perhaps, with all that infrastructure, so trying to insource a lot of those things could end up being very costly because you, you, know, you, quote, you quote five million in operating expense, that's a 5% what we call in the business total expense ratio already before I even deploy a dollar. So, um, you know, coming back, I think, it, I think it comes back to how we define a family office, which is really important. And I think a lot of people who are setting up family offices think they need all that infrastructure. Correct. But that is probably a miscalculation. So, I mean, Lynn, how do you think about what you insource, outsource, work with service providers to really get best-in-class outcomes? Right. Actually, I like to attack the question on costs. I we don't spend five million a year <laughs> on cost, but cost is a subject that um, that is raised very often. It's going up every year, like the cost of Japanese food in Singapore. <laughs> so, um, but for us, we think about the costs associated with not having a family office. Um, we really like the tax clarity and tax efficiency that we get operating out of Singapore. And we've seen really the benefits of being able to pull resources from various family members and develop scale that we could have access, direct access to some of the best GPs across asset classes. Uh, we're talking about the likes of Apollo for private credit or Brookfield for infrastructure. And that, that's made us very happy because we're able to access them directly and we're able to access them at a cheaper price uh, without having to go to um, uh, through the banks. And let's not the forget, uh, forget the benefits of just 
having centralized control over your business investments as well as risk management. And for us, what is the most important thing is having a structure that provides continuity through generations, which is needed for legacy creation. So every time the subject of cost comes up, we think about what will it cost us to not have a structure like this? Because all these points that are important to us, we would not be able to achieve um, without, um, without, without having a family office or private um, investment office in place. And um, so that's how we think about it. But we don't do uh, you know, things as extensively as I would say with Roger's shop or even Jimmy's shop. We don't have our own PMs. We, we spend most of our time uh, selecting managers or the investment team does that, not, for, not, not me. And the game plan is to not do your own equity or credit selection, but to work with the best managers out there to help us streamline our costs. So that's one thing, uh, one thing we do. We don't have our own research people. We, we basically subscribe to research pieces um, and work with entities like Cambridge. So, uh, so that's what we do. Okay, great. Thanks, Lynn. I like that. I like that the cost of not having is a great, is a great way to think about yeah. it. Key takeaway there is that people who are considering the setup should definitely make that calculation before they set up. And it's also very important to understand, I think, how difficult it is to recover a lot of that cost in investment outcomes uh, by nature of how you know, markets actually function. Thinking ahead, and this is my last question, everyone can answer, but I want to start with Jimmy. When you think about generational wealth pass through, so passing down through generations. And we're obviously reaching a point in Asia where a lot of wealth is passing from G1 to G2 or even G2 to G3s. How do you think about keeping all the wealth together as one, splitting the wealth into you know, different pies so you empower in a different way? Like what, what kind of structures do you find to be um, successful? Look, right now, uh, we have one family office, and um, it serves the family very well. We are talking about first-generation wealth and second-generation wealth. Uh, and the reason is this, that you have a founder who has made all this money, and he has a vision, and he wants to pass on to the children and their children. Uh, and in this regard, uh, he is driving the whole show. He has set the vision and set the values. And when it comes to investment, also has set the process so that everybody understands the investment process. Uh, you have to understand, like the answers just now, that this business is an economies of scale business. The bigger you are, the more benefits you have. What are some of the benefits? The benefits are, number one, you can hire the best people. Number two, you can operate in a lot more areas. Number three, you have access to a lot more products. People want to talk to you. People want to show you their product. The top PE firms in the world will want to do business with you. And number four, you will have all the co-investment opportunities with some of the top firms in the world. And some of those opportunities can turn out to be uh, complementary to our existing businesses. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it's a significant economies of scale advantage in this business. And therefore, the bigger you are, the better it will be. So it is unwise to have one family office broken up into many, many family offices over time. So it is very clear that uh, we have been in this from uh, 2002, 20 years already. We have continued the process, long journey, and stayed as one, and stayed as one family office, and it is likely to be the case for many generations to come for them because of economies of scale. Of course, there will be a situation where in one generation, somebody hit a jackpot like Facebook or something, and then that guy wants to set up his own family office and can see that family office will exist as part of the original family office. But for now, it is one family office because there's a lot of economies of scale advantages. 
This is a very difficult question to answer. I feel like, because uh, every year we probably do around 20 to 25 uh, what I call interns, and these are people anywhere from 18 years old to 30 years old, where we uh, have them run through this internship and uh, we train them up. We literally, we walk them, we, we have them sit down and go through all the family governance type issues of their particular family. We have them sit down with uh, various government officials to talk about, you know, family office set up and, and setting up VCCs and what have you. It's very, I'll tell you why it's difficult, because we got people who, you know, they might have gone to NUS or Cambridge or whatever, but they're sitting in Lang Kui Fung the whole time. Uh, that's, you know, that's where their head is. And then there's others who take this very, very seriously, where they're actually paying attention at the particular uh, investment issues or the transitional issues. So, but, you know, we're, we're doing our best in terms of trying to set up the best structures. And one area, in fact, uh, just sort of in there, one area which we like working with in Dallas is really getting that next generation really involved and having the, the platform of in Dallas for that next generation, we believe, uh, has been very helpful for us. Th thanks for the ad, uh, Kenny. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Raj, uh, yeah. of course, Iconics worked with families all over the world. Like, what have you observed in, in a few bullet points? Um, I, I would concur everything that everyone said. The, the only thing I would addition, uh, add to, to what's been said is I think sometimes people make the mistake in the establishment of family office between the concept of risk-taking, risk allocation, and risk transfer. And I think Lynn was saying partnering with, with managers who can, who've got competitive advantage. And I think sometimes family offices make the mistake that they think they're in the risk-taking business. They are not in the risk-taking business. They are in the risk transfer business. Their job is to partner with people that have genuine competitive advantage and access and expertise in areas that help them furnish their allocations, aligning them to their risk-adjusted objectives for the long term. And I think that's the one big lesson uh, from family office evolutions from 1.0 to 5.0. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. That's all we have time for. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you. Oh.